Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Punch Card Investing. We're short a couple members, but we have very special guest in Jason, the afternoon investor, here to join us today. Always, always happy to have him and all of his insight. We know he's a fan favorite uh, and also the undisputed king of the chat. So uh, it's good to get him out of the chat in person or in this weird virtual setting, uh, and uh, we can talk about some value investing things uh, today. Um, we got a question posed or a little while back, got a question posed in the Discord. Someone was asking about how um, uh, they wanted us to talk about risks with value investing and maybe the unique challenges with the value approach in general, um, defining what risk is. And I think it'll lead, we were talking about how it'll probably lead into a dis uh, discussion about value traps, which is something everyone's always wondering about. What What is a value trap? What is something that actually is a good value play? So we'll get into all that today before we do that be sure to smash that like button because that goes a long way towards helping the channel as does subscribing so you don't miss any new episodes since we put out a new show every single week around this time. Uh, sorry for the slightly late start. We were getting settled in and making sure everything was lined up, but uh, it'll pretty much always be around this time if you're new to the show. And uh, if, you can't, if you can't make it live, you can always watch the replays. And if you want to get a, a topic proposed, you can head on over to the Discord, which is always included in the link below. And that's free. You can join a lot of smart folks in there talking about different value opportunities and all sorts of things about investing. So check that out as well. Um, anyways, shall we uh, dive into this topic of risk? It probably makes sense to define what risk is because there's uh, it's not exactly the... Uh, it's not always cut and dry how, how, how we define risk. Maybe it depends on the situation, but anyone want to jump on that? How do you guys define risk? Why, why don't we hand it off to our, our esteemed guest, Jason? Um, how would you define risk when it comes to investing in stocks or really in anything? Well, I try, I try my best to keep things simple. And uh, for me, I think basically if, if you, for me, if I can look at risk as the chance that I lose money and how much money I could lose, everything can work backwards from there. So like maybe you could call risk, like not understanding a company correctly and all that kind of stuff, but it all will kind of stem back from how can I lose money? And if so, how much, and what are the odds of losing money? So basically how, how much I can lose. And once I know that I can kind of decide uh, on the other side of things, if it's, if it's worth, if the upside is, is worth the, the risk there. So for me, uh, how much money can I lose and what are the odds of it? So like a permanent loss of capital sort of thing. I think, I, I think that's how uh, someone like Monish Pabrai has framed it. That's what risk yeah, is. Yeah, that, that's, that's the only thing it means to me. It's like the, the permanency. It means nothing about like uh, if the stock will go down in the in the next few months. Maybe if the business is going to go through a bad like a business cycle or a bad year or two, maybe financially while they do a bunch of investments. None of that to, is risk to me. The only thing is risk is is permanent loss of capital and how much capital I could lose and then the chances of that. So it's a little more nuanced for me than permanent loss of capital because it also looks at how much and the chances, but it all comes back to permanent loss of capital. So yeah. Jason, you don't look at the beta of a stock before getting into it? <laughs> all the Greeks. Not something you consider? Sometimes uh, when I see the beta, it can tell me the signals, like what the rest of the market is feeling about it. And will time tell me when to jump. No, I'm kidding. Just feeling a little <laughs> bit uh, trollish tonight. No, uh, no, I don't look at the beta as all. Do you guys think that is, I know with Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger and those annual meetings through the 2000s and stuff, they talked a lot about beta and Greek symbols. I'm getting up there in years now. It's been a long time since I was in a finance course in college. Do you think that's still the thing, um, like efficient market and beta is risk and all that? Or do you think they're a little more in our direction now? Maybe you guys I, are, I, have experienced it more recently. I took some finance courses a few years ago, and it's definitely pitching the uh, efficient market hypothesis. Wow. Um, not, 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 not super overbearing. I didn't take any like uh, sort of stock investing courses, but like in basic finance, it, there was definitely a push towards this efficient argument and certainly in my economics courses um which is kind of hilarious because you take one look at like how people behave you're like eh. <laughs> really <laughs> how do you explain the fact that there's like a thousand different s p 500 index funds that sometimes trade at different prices it's like wait a second if it's really efficient shouldn't they all be at the same at the same price um so They're almost efficient yeah right yeah almost. 
That's probably a good way to put it. I, funny enough, in law school, I, I took like a securities law course, and that's where we had more pushback against the efficient market hypothesis uh, in um, in law school than we did in, in, in my finance courses in, in undergrad, which makes no sense. <laughs> but, so, um, yeah, it's it, I, it sounds still, like it hasn't changed down, very much. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think um, I think Karan's got it right there. Like markets are mostly efficient most of the time, but there's a big difference between that and fully efficient all of the time. <laughs> That's right. kind of the reason that that you know people like Buffett have made so much money is they've been able to take advantage of little inefficiencies, and they, there doesn't need to be a lot of inefficiency all the time. Like they can they can swing big at the occasional opportunity and do really well over time. It would be a lot of people push back on that point, Tom, with like, oh, well, guys like Buffett, Peter Lynch, name any successful investor. Ah, oh, that's just survivorship bias. And okay, sure, maybe. But then you look at their the way they're doing it. They're they're following a a process. They're following a method. It's not just like it's dumb luck, or at least it doesn't seem that way to me. Um, and <laughs> given our approach as value investors, we we would hope that it's not um, it's not the case that it's just survivorship bias um but it is something to keep in mind that like when you're looking at a survey of people just because someone's been successful uh doesn't mean that uh it's because they it's not it doesn't mean that that's replicable but in this case with the amount of track record we have with successful investors a lot of them tend to follow a pretty similar approach you're looking at the fundamentals of the business they're gonna when business earnings grow the value of their portfolio grows and so on so if you can find a way to replicate that which is much easier said than done seems like it makes sense that you can keep doing that into the future yeah i, I, mean, I the, feel like the, oh sorry tom go ahead yeah i was gonna say i mean the the efficient market argument for why people like buffett and munger exist is that they're just a monkey flipping heads you know 50 times <laughs> right. in a row or whatever but actually tony's just put a comment of what i'm about to say but you know it's like would it would it still be um you know that they are just a statistical anomaly if all the monkeys came from all the monkeys that were flipping 50 years in a row came from the same zoo, which is kind of what, um, you know, Buffett was getting at with the super investors of Graham and Doddsville and what you just said, Jack, like all these people that have really good, like 20, 30, 40, 50 year track records of outperformance tend to be like the, you know, the value investors out of initially the Ben Graham school of thought. And I would say that survivorship bias, um, any any stats majors could push back on this, but I think as you increase the amount of time, the chances of survivorship bias being the only thing that's really determining things probably seems to decrease. Whereas, you know, you have someone whose portfolio skyrockets in a year because of something unreasonable that's not really re replicable, um, at least in a reliable way. Um, that might be a better example of survivorship bias versus someone who's following a method for a long, long time. Um, over many decades, over different eras, and the same sort of generalized approach, the Graham and Dodgeville approach, if you will, um, has tended to work more often than not. And th that seems like it's less likely to be just simple survivorship bias versus you know someone whose stock portfolio triples over a one-year span. Now all of a sudden they think they're a super genius. So, so I'm I'm curious. I feel like I might have stolen the uh, the risk answer because it seems like. Um, most all of us probably feel like permanent loss of capital is definitely the risk, the main risk. Is there any other area that you guys look at as risk beyond permanent loss, uh, permanent loss of capital? Yeah, I, I sort of have one thing that I'd, um, I, I agree with that, that permanent loss of capital is how I personally define risk as opposed to beta and short-term volatility and stuff. But there's one other thing that, again, I think this is something that, Buffett has said in some old CNBC interviews around risk, which I think a lot of people kind of gloss over. And, um, you know, at a certain point, like if you if you don't take enough, at least like academic definition of risk and you don't, you know, have decent exposure to equities or real estate or some sort of growth asset, like another risk is just not ever getting to the promised land because you, you sort of were never an aggressive enough investor to kind of do that. So, um in some way, like being a hyper conservative investor is a very like long term risky approach to, just because you kind of never make any money. So <laughs> that's sort of a second thing that I'd tack on to what I think you said, that, Jason. I think that's what Tony's saying here in the chat opportunity cost. It ties into opportunity cost. That, that's the big, yeah. Um, yeah. 
It's the returns you would have had had you done something else. It's not really loss of capital, like you're putting a dollar in and getting none out. It's you're not even putting the dollar in and you don't get all those gains. It's the opposite. Yeah. Even like when management fails to execute, I feel like that's also a risk. So if you look at investing in a certain catalyst, for example, like discovery, things don't always work out, right? We hope things work out, the merger works out, but if something happens, management fails to execute, we don't lose capital, but it's an opportunity cost. That money could have been invested into something else. So I think that's also another lens that we could view risk as. And also, like as an added wrinkle to permanent loss of capital, uh, we were just kind of saying that volatility isn't isn't risk in itself. Uh, we, we talked about it a bit last week as well. But at a certain point, depending on how your portfolio is structured, if you have a lot of margin debt, for example, volatility all of a sudden can become risk because it could drive you towards permanent loss of capital because of a margin call or something like that. So otherwise, if you're you know, all cash, you just put a bunch of money into your portfolio and hold forever. The only way you're going to have that permanent loss of capital is if maybe you fall into a value trap and it never gets back up to the price you bought in or the company goes under and you you get wiped out that way. So uh, there's no margin call to worry about is what I'm getting at. Um, but that's one situation where volatility actually can be risky is when you add debt or something like that to the equation to where if a price hits a certain point, you have to sell and liquidate and then all of a sudden you're you're out back to zero. Do, uh, do any of you younger gentlemen with your whole future ahead of you and a chance to make a few mistakes and recover, do any of you buy on margin, if I might ask? Not stocks, but real estate. <laughs> I, I, I use that. Tax code leverage to like here with real estate. Not, not, not quite, not quite. I, I think as my, okay. right now I can float a lot of it with my income, but at a certain point when the property, when my uh, portfolio gets too big, <laughs> I don't. I don't want to say too big, but uh, as the debt payments get bigger, then all mm -hmm. of a sudden I'm relying on my investments to really pay for everything in much more than I would now. But I always get reserves. But I, I use um, I use margin to float my down payment for this place, um, and then immediately pay that down over the next few months. Uh, it's just a way that I can stay fully invested in the stock market in the meantime. Uh, and get my maximum returns that way. It adds some risks, of, of course, because but, of what we just talked about. I, I mean, I like the way you do it with the real estate debt because isn't it pretty much like they can't just come to you and say, hey, Jack, you owe us all this money. It's like you've got it just in contract. You have to pay X amount per year for 10, 20, 30 years. Well, and there's no no margin call risk, right? Right. That's estate. for the for the real estate debt itself. Yeah. Like the, like your 30 year fixed rate mortgage loan. Yes, that's mm. that's the case. And that's why so I'm attractive. Yeah. A lot more um, comfortable with that than the margin I used for the down payment. That is not one of those loans. It was only at two percent at the time, but it's variable interest. Um, if my portfolio fell, I think, like 50 percent in a day, then I would be on the hook for, for that or something like that. The companies I invest in, I wouldn't think that would happen because they're pretty, they have pretty strong balance sheets, but Hey, you never know what'll happen in a, uh, in a given week in the stock market. <laughs> but, uh, um, I was willing to, to face that risk for a short period of time. I wouldn't be willing to hold like a bunch of margin for a very long period of time. Cause it, mm -hmm. every day that goes by that, that risk of getting a margin call, that risk of some crash happening increases. And it's an exponential sort of increase if we're playing the probabilities here. Um, so, mm. Tom, are you like I, buying like on 50% margin or 30%? <laughs> Leveraged options. <laughs> no, I'm, um, I, I don't use margin. I would be open to doing something similar to what Jack has done once I have kind of real estate in my portfolio. But as it stands right now, um, no margin for me. Although I'm not sure if you guys caught this a couple of weeks ago, but Charlie Munger was on a podcast. Um, what? With that some radio host. <laughs> You have you guys actually not seen this? Yeah. Was no, he in his big no. chair? He's he's in his big uh, chair. Well, kind of. It was, it was audio <laughs> only, but he was on with like a. Uh, I think the guy was like some sort of psychology professor, and there was a. They had an economist on as well, but anyway, um, kind of in that podcast, Charlie Munger said that his biggest mistake was not going going out and borrowing a bunch of money to buy an oil company back in like the seventies. So, um, that <laughs> that's kind of an interesting one to to hear come out of one of the goats right uh, yeah any anything in hindsight this is the hindsight you know yeah. like you can say that you know, why why did we load up the farm on 
any altcoin that went up 500 million percent like go for it <laughs> yeah but this is this is manga saying it's like the cheapest stock he's ever seen and he, i mean he says in this interview like you know I've, I've got a few billion but i would have a few i would have several more billions had i had i gone ahead and done this i think i think he's gonna do all right <laughs> he'll be fine <laughs> No, I wonder how he'd behave. Would he behave differently had he had he done that? The thing about debt is, it it, it you're thinking about it. Um, even when he got yeah. reserves, like at least, I'll speak for myself, at least I recognize I have a lot of debt. I don't really have the option of you to just like stop working for a extended period of time because I have these payments to meet, and my reserves will only get me through for so long. Um, so maybe that's motivating for some people, and it, it'll keep you going. But it's uh, it's you don't want to hold this for the rest of your life is what I should say. Um, at least at a super significant level, um, whatever, whatever makes you comfortable, I suppose. Um, for some people that means having no debt ever because they just can't stomach it. And if you're going to be an unreasonable investor when you have debt, then don't use it. Um, because you're probably going to lose more money doing that than the extra money you might gain by leveraging your portfolio because you uh, can't stomach the, whatever the risks that come with that debt. Yeah, just um, just quickly to wrap up the manga thing. One of us should probably make a video on this topic, but um, I think I think manga, what's that? I think Brad's doing it right now. So he yeah, <laughs> yeah but that's why Brad's not here. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, I think I think manga thought it was worth ten times the current price, so you know ninety percent margin of safety, and it ended up being I think a thirty x in two years. It got bought out. Um, wow, well, just. Astronaut. This was Belridge. Yeah. I mean, Belridge, I think Belridge Belridge Oil was the company. Yeah. yeah. Crazy. But look, he ended yeah. up a billion. You only 30 like, X's so. in two years. Yeah. 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 What about you, Jason? Did you ever dip into margin for anything? Or are no, you I, dipping into it ever? No, what, what, no never. When, when I say margin, I specifically mean like borrowing against your stock portfolio through these yep. brokerages. And the thing that scares the, the heck out of me about that is that if the price goes down of your stocks and the value to your loan or whatever hits that margin call threshold, the price goes down, that's out of your control. And then they just can call your loan and, and force you to sell and lock in a permanent loss of capital. To me, that the fear of that like totally outweighs anything. And I've even had some situations like I ended up not, not doing it, but I was tempted. Um, I, I was going to go out and get like a loan, just a personal signature loan at six or seven percent, pay back over five or seven years. Jack's head's about to explode. He hates that six or seven percent. But um, th what I liked about that, I was going to use that to go buy a cheap stock. What I liked about that is that it was just like, OK, it's just tied to me. I can always come up with that certain amount of money that I was going to borrow. It wasn't that much. And if the price of my stocks went down, it had nothing to do with that. And they could never margin call me. And so I was tempted to do that, but I'm not, I decided not to. And that just scares me so much with margin calls. They're, it's out of your control. And two things with that, like Warren Buffett says, the first thing is like, he says, anything can happen in markets. And all of us are relatively young. And the stock market since 2009 has pretty much been just a breeze and it's been going straight up. But anything truly could happen and i don't want to be in a position where they can call in my my uh my margin call there and, and force me to sell my stocks and take the money um the other thing is i just like thank god that buffett people like buffett and uh monish pabright like they teach us these things like they tell us just don't do it don't buy stocks on margin don't do it and i've heard that from him uh buffett specifically so many times and i've heard monish talk about the story about rick garen and talking to charlie about that or to warn about that personally in their lunch it's like seared into me now and i just like anytime i think about it the other day i saw a brokerage was offering 0.75 percent uh interest rate and i was like man i could just buy more of the stuff i like and pay barely any interest but but i hear this old guy's voice in my head just don't do it and so i can't just do it cash. so i will never do <laughs> it yeah just take the cash and hold it and then let inflation do it and then pay it back. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> something something like just, that. I can't do it. Would you consider yeah, options then? I mean, options. I, I was about to ask that. Way to use leverage. You know, I was, uh, I'm married now and I was having trouble in my marriage the other day and I found an option strategy that 
fixes every problem in your life, including your marriage. So, Quran, of course, I would do options. And you're an idiot, Quran, if you don't do options. I was wondering where you're going with that. <laughs> I thought, sorry, I thought that's how we talked about it. Sorry, Quran, I got too, too aggressive there. Honestly, and I say this with pride, I don't understand options. I, I've tried to look into them. Yeah, I kind of get it generally, but I don't have a comfort level with it. It's something I went like 33 years in life without ever thinking about. I've been thinking about companies and stocks and PEs and book value and all that for like the last 15, 20 years. I don't feel comfortable with it. Um, and I think all this stuff where people are so confident about their strategies are a risk-free 15% like that exists in the world. I think that's a weird uh symptom of this crazy bull market that we're in and we're at the top of a bull market not saying it's going to end tomorrow it could go on another decade but i just think like that just doesn't sound like it could be but the zombies that talk about that are so convinced of their strategies it's kind of fun to watch them talk but no i don't consider options because uh, i don't really understand it sorry Karan, Karan, you put me, Karan, put me on you, a tangent you, there you do some leaps, right, Kron? Haven't you done that? I'm recently? learning. I'm learning. It's just more like I'm paying tuition to learn something new. You know, <laughs> that that that's the so old investor losses. adage. If, when you lose money, it's it's not a loss. It's hey, the other change. thing I wonder with the <laughs> options is like if you lock in that guaranteed 15 percent, I'm like, who's on the other side of that trade? Are they just complete idiots, or like what what is it about this time that? Locks it in. Jason, but no, people I, I buying buy companies. GameStop at like five hundred dollars. Yes, there are always there's always <laughs> someone on the other side. That's good point. Good point. Good point. So, um, the thing about options, talking about this permanent loss of capital thing, there's time decay built into the option because it will expire on a date, and after that date, it's either in the money or it's not. If it's out of the money, that means the option is literally worthless, and you go to zero. <laughs> Um, if you don't sell it or exercise it before that, but if it's out of the money, you can't exercise it. Um, so what a lot of value investors do though, we've talked about it before, they'll sell put options at a certain price that they'd be willing to buy a stock at. So if a stock's at a hundred dollars a share and you really want to buy it at $80 a share and you have all this cash sitting around, not doing anything anyways. You can say, hey, I will sell an option. I'm going to write a contract saying, I will buy this stock if it hits $80 before this date. And you sell that contract. Someone buys it, whoever this greater fool is or whatever. <laughs> and um, and it's a person who has 100 shares or the money to buy 100 shares um, or the money to sell 100 shares to you. Um, and that's the that's a way you can generate some cash while you while you, or generate some income while you wait for the stock to hit that price. If it never hits that price, you made that premium by selling or writing the contract. Um, and if it does hit the price, then you might be forced to buy the stock at that price. But if you're doing your valuation work properly, it's a price you'd be willing to buy it at anyway. So um, you still end up keeping that premium. And it's like a sort of discount, I suppose, on on buying the stock at that price you wanted to buy it at. Um, that's, that, that's, I think, I don't want to call it the safest way because there's there's risk there too, opportunity cost being the biggest one, um, which is probably the, the way that jives the best with um the value investing strategy because you're picking like a target price and then making some cash in the meantime um yeah but that opportunity costs right like if if the stock price never goes to 80 from 100 and then in the next 20 years it goes from 100 to 2000 you missed right well sure um yeah. but you could say the same thing about if you left it in cash anyways and didn't buy the stock at that price it's but i'm, I'm not implying... i'm not a sovereign nation i'm not a huge <laughs> insurance company that's trying to squeak out percentage points i'm just a guy trying to get rich and like can you yeah. really get rich banging out like these little percentage insurance premiums right um, and will those yes. exist will those exist in a bear market that's my question or in a different market so if anything uh, the thing that determines stuff. option prices is what's called implied volatility so basically the nervousness of the market um that's where you can actually make some serious money when times are really volatile um, because option premiums will skyrocket because people are betting on the stock moving a ton. And that's when you can really make a ton of money because of the leverage implied with options. Um, so you might actually be able to make more in a, in a bear market with something like that because the option premiums will go up so you can sell it for more money. And maybe that percentage might be a little bit more significant, but yes, you're right. Um, probably depending on how you do it, you're probably not going to make like, a life-changing amount of money by writing options on a huge cash. All right, board. one more one more thing with beef with the options. 
I keep hearing this 15, 15%, right? Oh my God, 15%. Well, inflation- <laughs> this free guaranteed? What, well, what if inflation's at like six or 7%, you know, if, what if we're in one of those kind of generations? All of a sudden, or maybe 10 or 11%, your 15% doesn't look as attractive as the stock going from 100 to 2000. God, we could have just wished if Warren Buffett would have put an option down on C's candy, right? And um, you know, never got it. Buffett actually wrote um, during the financial crisis. He wrote a few options on the S and P, if I'm not mistaken. He said Warren has done this. It's not covered very much. Um, Yeah, I don't because probably because it's it's kind of complicated to explain. It's a simple concept that's hard to explain. It's a weird thing. um, Writing options. It's a hard concept. That's hard to explain. Maybe <laughs> once it easy. clicks, <laughs> but but yeah, it, it's definitely not hard to explain. At all. Um, I will say there there does seem to be some kind of these people on Wall Street where they're not trying to make twenty baggers and stuff. They're trying to produce returns with no beta and like just guaranteed returns. Yeah, there just there does seem to be a lot of these traders out there who can figure out ways during short periods of times. Maybe it's a generation. Maybe it's just years. Mm-hmm. Maybe it's a few months where they can just lock in a 6% risk-free trade. Um, so yeah, there seems to be something about that, but that's totally, um, at least for me, it's not my area. And to that, competence is key. Yeah, like if, you don't, if you don't know what you're doing with anything, it doesn't have to be options, it can be anything, probably is not worth throwing a significant amount of money towards it until you do know what you're doing. And maybe you'll realize that that's actually a bad idea and you won't do it. So it yeah. definitely applies with options because of the uh, because of the time decay we talked about, you can lose a significant amount of money very quickly uh, with options if you don't know what you're doing. Um, so just be careful out there, everyone. And speaking of being careful, I did want to just put this in here. Our man, Bill Huang, from April of 2021, was leveraged uh, 10 times, which means for every dollar he had in equity, he had $10 in margin of some sort from all these different CFT. banks. And he, um, uh, I like the, I like the flames in the lower ad for a second there. It was, oh, yeah. <laughs> I, I didn't notice that. Um, he, um, so he had all this leverage, a bunch of stocks. He had a bunch of money in Viacom, CBS. If you r- recall the crash that happened back in discovery. Thank yeah. You. And, and Dis- yeah. Oh yes. Thank you so much. It was good yeah. times. It went up to 80. It went up to 80 and I sold half. <laughs> it was nice. He, he, um, so he had a bunch of, of money in a bunch of different stocks, highly, highly leveraged in a concentrated portfolio at that. So as soon as there was a dip in like one of these stocks, he got margin called right away. But the problem is all these different lenders that he had didn't realize he had loans mm-hmm. of all these different banks because he did it through mm-hmm. his family office, which has different reporting requirements. So a lot of them didn't even realize how leveraged out of his ears he was. Um, and he lost $20 billion, went to zero in two weeks or two days like this, this article says. Um, and they're still investigating that the SEC is trying to figure out what went wrong. Cause um, it just shows you the danger of over leveraging, especially with margin where things can get called and all of a sudden you have to liquidate. You don't have any time for prices to recover and you don't have the cash to cover it because you're leveraged. Um, so yes, be careful out there. Yeah. Bill was here for a good time. Not a long time. <laughs> yes. Just how how much money is enough? Twenty billion dollars? Like he 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 was a he wasn't just twenty billion all debt. Like he had serious equity. Um, but, but nope, just had to keep going. He was like what five x five x leverage? Ten x? Yeah, it's ten x. Well, they're not actually what... sure. The thing is, they're not actually sure because like it was it's all private and they're trying to uncover that. But the estimates are that he was ten x leveraged at the peak. That's so what I remember reading is that's what they estimated. Yeah, crazy. Dang. Big so bill. Apart from value options, trends. the other things, yeah. So, but Bryce actually said that he does not think that value traps exist. They just are called mistakes, investment mistakes. Do you guys agree with that, or do you think Who value traps? But Bry, yeah, that's a good question. Um, that, that's how I kind of view it. Go ahead, Tom. Yeah, yeah, I, I tend to agree. Um, but I think there's, <laughs> I think there's a few common areas where those. Um, mistakes tend to show up like mm-hmm. um you know you see them in you see them in cyclicals like something just has a low pe or whatever multiple you want to use because it's at the top of a cycle or whatever um kind of written down a few others here like cyclicals the one that comes to mind um 
some of these like Japanese net nets that have just been around forever where the cash is like, uh, it's a Fugazi, it's a Fugazi. Uh, it's just kind of, it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's a Wazi, it's a Wazi, it's a Wazi. It's kind of there, but it never gets paid out, you know? Uh, so, it, you know, there's no like actual catalyst to, to get the cash out of that thing. I think that kind of falls into the, into the value trap. Um, Jason's trying to start a drama in the chat here. <laughs> I think that falls into the, into no, the I'm just curious. Category. I saw someone talking about it the other day and they were very excited. I just was curious. Yeah, and they um, can't build enough RVs to keep up with demand. How is that a value trap? <laughs> yeah. Just asking a question. Yeah. Just ask a question. We could talk. We could talk about Thor. Thor to the moon. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> um, and just just very quickly, a couple others I jotted down here were like unexpected shear dilution. Uh, I think you see that in a lot of these early stage software companies, where you know some of the multiples kind of look egregious, but even if they did look reasonable i think a lot of people just miss factoring in a bunch of dilution mm -hmm. and then um you know a huge amount of debt like i think we've already had curate mentioned in the in the chat here somewhere i think it trades at three times earnings or something but on an enterprise value basis it's probably four times that multiple three or four times that multiple so tom could you explain dilution for those maybe less familiar uh yeah sure you own um you you own a, a piece of the pie and then your little, you know, there's more pieces of the pie created, so you suddenly own a, a, a smaller percentage of the thing. You don't get to feast quite as much as you first anticipated. I like looking at it like Jerome Powell getting his printer going, and there's more dollars floating around, so each dollar is worth less. The pie analogy yeah. works too. There's just more shares out shareholder there. To get a, if you want to get a feel of what dilution is like, be a Twitter shareholder. That's a great way to learn. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's like, um, you know, if you own 10% of a company or something and the earnings double over the next decade, well, that's great. But if they also doubled their share count, you've kind of gone nowhere on a per share basis. So that's right. a risk you need to incorporate. I, I think never Tony's thought of that trying to start some beef here in the chat. He's got SRG. <laughs> <laughs> it's got potential. <laughs> that's a Jackson guy, right? No, I saw, yeah, I, saw, I saw someone else. Tony mentioned it as well. Oh, um, yeah. are, are any of you guys worried at all who are in Seritage along with me that in five years or six years we're going to be sitting here talking about, oh, this construction project, that construction project, and it's going to work out great. Just give it more time. And the market's <laughs> gone up another two or three times. I'm the a land worried. value. Yeah, I mean, the land value would probably go with it too. So they'd probably be okay. But if, if that really happened and they haven't been called by daddy warren or whoever the the creditor is at that point mm -hmm. yeah i mean it's seritage isn't risk risk free <laughs> i mean no. uh, you know at, yeah. at the moment it's um you know you can all, almost think about it kind of like a net net where you're buying assets at, at you know cents on the dollar 50 cents on the dollar or whatever net asset value you use but you know if it all works out there should be a catalyst for cash flows to turn positive and that value to be recognized. I don't think it's, um, yeah, it's so, not something so it's where not there's a, no it's trap. Not a trap. It's not a trap because you're aware of the risk. And and we've kind of judged that, hey, it we're willing to take trap. that risk. I mean, if a I mean, if you run into a bear trap in the woods, just because you see it doesn't mean the trap's not there. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good point. I'll just step in it as I see it. Oh, crap. <laughs> Yeah, to to me, uh, to me, a value trap is something where the earnings just fall off a cliff that you didn't expect, or you know, you think you're buying assets assets at cents on the dollar, but there's no catalyst for that kind of, you know, that gap to close, right? And I I don't think that's the case. It's like trap. when I think about value trap, I think about like uh, you're you're looking at something that other people are looking at it, and you're interpreting it what will turn out to be the wrong way, or you're looking at this picture and you're missing something like with the Japanese cash thing, it's like you, you see the cash, but what you're missing is that you're not the boss. You don't own that. Like they've got the mantra there is not going to give up the cash. There's like, um, there's some um, Hawaiian stock company that owns like a huge amount of land. It's like, I don't know, Maui Tropicana or banana company or something. Uh, the former founder of AOL, uh, I think owns a lot. I think the majority of the stock and I think it trades for like a discount of the land in Hawaii if you just looked up the value per acre and all that. But 
the trades like that because apparently the guy's not going to turn that into money at any time soon. That's what I think the market thinks about the stock. So, but I could see myself. I didn't do this, but the way I would think about it, this company a few years ago is like, oh my gosh, look at the land there. No one else sees this. It's less than the price, and I'm going to buy it. And then you sit there and nothing happened. So that's one of the examples. I brought that down to Tom that just when management won't turn the assets into into value. Yeah, I've got a similar said, yeah. example to that also. This one, Maui yeah. Land and Pineapple Company. That's it. Yeah. And if you look back at what it's done over a long period of time, I don't think it's done much. I don't think we'll find out. Yeah. It's, eh. And uh, yeah. apparently I think it's probably worth more than like the land is worth a lot more than the price. But I think there's like a majority shareholder that they don't seem to be taking action on it very quickly. So it's like Jason, a, man wanna... a management roadblock, essentially. Yeah. Jason, Jason, I want to ask you about something you've, um, I think, You've been thinking through quite a bit recently which is the perfect investment and this um this okay, example yeah. of ted weschler investing in dillard's and i think the you know the downside protection was you're buying dillard's at less than the liquidation value of the real estate and presumably there's upside yeah. as earnings come in um less than the liquidation value of the real estate after paying off the debt yeah yeah so it was like risk um, it was beyond risk free yeah, so so what was the? I mean, because I, I haven't studied Dillard's closely, but they're paying a, a like monster special dividend. So I'm assuming they've had a whole ton of earnings come in recently, and that's kind of shot the stock price up. But I mean, did that have potential to be a value trap? And you kind of it's worked out because the business started producing cash. I don't right? like to if me, it was purely just the real estate aspect. I can probably never give like a. a a crystal clear answer because I'm so warped by looking back and seeing the great result, the 15 bagger or whatever mm. it's been. But um, looking back and studying it, I don't think it could have ever turned into a value trap mm. because when you bought that company in the fall, I think it was the fall of 2020. Um, it was the price was so cheap of the company. Uh, it was less than the real estate value after paying off the debt so you could you could take away the debt and there was still value left over on the real estate and it was either way you looked at the real estate you could look you could have looked at it from like a seritage point of view where it's like okay we're going to take these department stores we own and then turn them into something else and rent it out for a lot higher square foot or you could just you could have even looked at um just the value of like that was on the books or something like that, like a more conservative way. It was, it was so cheap. Um, and uh, the, I get, so yeah, even if the world, the department store world would have ended and they would have never cash flowed again, they could have used their real estate value to pay off their debt. And there still would have been more value left over than the market price of the company. So I don't think that could be a value trap because you knew what the what your you knew how much you could lose and it wasn't even about like the odds of losing it or trying to judge if people will ever go shop again it was literally like i know how much i could lose and by the way i can't even lose anything because the real estate value was worth more than the debt it was it was like so cheap um mm -hmm. so i mean anything could happen and you could judge the real estate value wrong and then something could happen with real estate values if the virus really went bad and no one wanted anything for long periods of time. But because real estate, you can just look and uh, see what other stuff is worth. Man, it, it, it seems it just was absurdly cheap. By the way, if you follow Ted Wessler, not showing up in a lot of 13 G's and 5% ownership and all that kind of stuff. Um, hardly ever does. And so I think it was so cheap that he just wanted to do it. And um, yeah, perfect investment because you knew what the downside was. And in this case, the downside was less than limited. It was, it was nothing. Can we get a, can we get a Dillard stock chart up in here, Jack? I'm going to get my <laughs> neck ready, wild. neck ready. So I can look up into <laughs> yeah, the so right. Yeah, so we can see the top. That's yeah. I <laughs> did. <laughs> One thing I've I've been thinking about, do you have any idea why that wasn't bought under the Berkshire banner? Like how uh, does, th how does that I work? I thought about that. Um 
So it's not even so much. This doesn't do it justice. I mean, you got to look at like a, one year. maybe look at three year or five year. So and and then you can. I don't know. It just it's hard to. I mean, we're going from fifty because it was to, so cheap for so long. Fifty to two fifty, and down but, here. But in, but in reality, it was more like twenty five to yeah. to to two fifty or three hundred if you had sold at that point. And like Tom was saying, I think you're getting a a twelve dollar or fifteen dollar dividend coming up here soon. So <laughs> yeah, those yeah, are the best. Like, the, 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 like the dividend a, is more than the cost. I like, the, the, it's the best yeah. or near it. So, so why didn't he buy it for uh, Berkshire? The only thing I could think is like possibly at that point in time, um, I forget what the market cap got down to, but it might have been that it was too small. To, uh, he was working with too much capital at like eight billion or ten billion or twelve billion, whatever they're working with. Yeah. So if it was like fourteen times less than that or something like that. Yeah, just um, 10x yeah, less right. to make it easy you got like yeah you know, yeah 470 so then uh i don't know it just it might have been too small um and then the other times when they don't buy stuff but they buy it personally i think maybe there's some conflicts like maybe they've got furniture stores or some kind of store that just conflicted with it but i, it, I my guess mm -hmm. it would be it was the size they'd bid themselves up at that level <laughs> And yeah, to like it, yeah, and then you get into like um, how many share, what percent of the company trades every day on the market and is even exactly. available. Yeah, right. Kind of like uh, the reverse of like Elon trying to sell all of his Tesla shares. <laughs> like he has to do it yeah. over many days because there's just you destroy the entire market if you just yeah. flooded it all at once. And on the flip side, there's only so many so many shares to buy. Um, there's actually an interesting question in the in the chat to pivot a little bit here but um I, I hadn't thought of it this way but kabir says thoughts on turkey stock market and the currency crisis would you think turkey's a value trap i i would add to this i got i gotta is go current gotta is go. currency devaluation a um a a I, I wouldn't have thought of it as a value trap but it's kind of the it's very much like dilution only in this case it's currency being diluted rather than shares um thoughts on that Go for it, Jason. I know you're passionate. Oh, well, about <laughs> yeah, I mean, racist, it's a proud some, racist shareholder. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it is it is what it is. Honestly, if anything, um, as long as I know Monish, as long as I can know to the extent I can know Monish is still in it, I get tempted to buy more when the currency in Turkey gets weaker. I'm not a currency expert. I got to think through this more, but my thinking is that I can take American dollars and go buy this racist company that's quoted in lira. So I have to turn the dollars into lira before I buy it. I can now go buy more uh, because the um, dollar is so much stronger versus the lira now. So in this situation, I haven't done it because I bought so much uh, percentage wise uh, earlier. Um, and it's very interesting. The, the price of racist since I bought it is up 50%. But the lira is probably down like 50 to 60 or some percent like that. And, and there's like a 30 percent loss right now uh, on paper. Um, but, yeah, I think it I think it is a risk as long as you don't think the currency is going to turn around. My, my thoughts on this specific situation is it's in the newspapers like the Wall Street Journal every day now how horrible the situation is over there. And I just think it's back to that quote of um, if something can't sustain, it won't. And I think at some point, if the people over there want to stay in power, they're going to have to make their population less concerned about inflation. We know how to do that. We're starting to do it here in the United States. You make things tighter. You raise the interest rates. Um, I think at some point it'll it'll turn around. But yeah, it's it uh, it has taught me for sure um, when you buy stuff in other currencies and you have to when you sell it if you need to bring it back to dollars, you, you run a huge. Um, you run a risk that it could it could stay down. Yeah, I think Jason, the, um... do you know that you can use share site to <laughs> to tell us, <laughs> Karan. It's the perfect yeah. time to plug this. Tell us, Karan. What what we could use share site right to track the currency risks. Mm -hmm. How does it work, Tom? Do you do you know a bit about this? <laughs> this is a sleazy sales pitch. Um, <laughs> yeah. Not sleazy, wholesome, <laughs> excellent. No. Yeah, share site's genuinely very good. So you see, yeah, yeah. Your capital capital gains and losses. Here's yeah, the punch card portfolio. Not doing too capital hot. Capital gain, over the dividends, first, uh, and currency. Couple months. 
But as you can see right here, you got the currency tab and it shows any currency devaluation. This this base currency we're using is dollar. Oh my US god, who who bought Baba? <laughs> Who's responsible for that one? You got, you're wrong. Yeah. <laughs> I think yeah, someone called Bitcoin. Kidding, something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, my well, Bitcoin broker Frank told me about that. It was, it was Brad. Is, it was is Brad. Frank is Frank Brad the only one that's up with Kelly Parker? <laughs> He's the only one up and, and the and the Australian dollar is trying to pull him down, but it can't. <laughs> He's just above Nothing can pull down KPG. No. He's like, I, I tried to tell you guys, Kelly Partners, I tried to tell you. Yeah. Frank's been telling us to buy KPG since it was like, what, 91 cents in Australia? Cents. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I didn't know Frank when it was 91 cents, but I probably would have been on board had he, had he told me then. Um, by the time I got the write-ups from him and, and kind of read up about it, I think it was 250, and I thought it was kind of stretched there, but it's kind of... Just keep running. I'll but anyways, to finish the pitch. Shearsite.com <laughs> <laughs> forward slash punch card investing. That'll get you four months free off an annual subscription. And, and you can use a free you, and you can use a free version forever. Actually, and you can check out our well, and you can way. check out this portfolio in real time if you're super interested. Jack, no one wants to check out our portfolio. Like. Uh, yeah, not now. <laughs> Don't look at it now. We'll tell you when to look at it, and that'll be when it's uh, nice and green. Um, or we can just on. follow the financial education way and start a second portfolio. <laughs> yeah, have, have the public and the private portfolio going. <laughs> and, and, and we switch them on occasion. Just say we've repositioned whenever one goes up or down. Just um, just on this turkey thing. So the <clears throat> this is something I spoke to um, Matt Peterson about a few weeks ago when he was on the podcast. And he has a portion of his fund basically in turkey and his perspective has basically been and i think this may be the case with the racist properties but jason may know or we may need to figure this out but i think he's more or less buying turkish businesses where they do most of their business in more stable currencies like like a euro so you're effectively buying a european business in many ways i mean you're buying turkish real estate in the case of racist but you're effectively buying like a european esque business and they're trading at turkish multiples so you get this you know big discount and his view is that when currencies do stabilize you get you know re-rates up to more normal multiples um, when you say currency stabilize you mean when the world switches over to bitcoin <laughs> bitcoin bro yeah no comment <laughs> all right no, Tom, that's, uh, I, I that's think your friend that's, not you i think that's uh that's the way i'm thinking about it and um um I think it, it, it goes to a certain limit. Like if, you know, obviously if a country has super hyperinflation and a country falls apart, like World War II era countries fell apart with hyperinflation and stuff, then it's like, okay, maybe you're never going to get your money out and stuff. But yeah, if you think a, co a country's not going to fall apart um, and it will be able to have a s decent uh, currency at some point, then... Uh, that's how I think about it as well. And uh, what's ironic here is um, the leadership over there, they're saying we're going to keep lowering interest rates um, and making our currency cheaper almost because it's going to fuel an export boom in our country. And at least for me, that is working because I want to go now buy their businesses with dollars uh, and go buy them in, in lira. So if, if yeah, if a business doesn't really depend on the lira, um, so much then, uh, or at least they get their revenues and other things, um, or they've already spent their capital expenditures. And yeah, I think, um, it, it can be okay. But again, it's just like, how far do you want to push it? And you can read some of the recent articles, um, on Turkey. They are pushing it so hard right now in terms of, uh, their interest rates and the inflation that they're, they're living with. And, um, what's interesting is when I heard a lot of investors talk about Turkey, in earlier this year they got asked about the currency and stuff and like the currency yeah had gone down against the dollar over years but really in the last like few months it's just like like flat lightning um against a dollar and it's a it's a wild situation and um it'll just be interesting to see how it turns out seems like it'll it's get worse before it gets better yeah. but you know you never really know it's kind of like one of those timing the market things when it comes to current because like you're comparing one currency against many others. And like, even if everyone's printing, if everyone prints at the same rate, you know, you're not going to see wild swings between currencies, right? Or one would think, but even then you're going to get swings because it depends on 
demand, supply, all the fantastic things that everyone always tries to predict, but it's very difficult to. Can, can I give you guys um, a value trap that I uh, fell into as an earlier value investor? Um, Please. I would sometimes like when I was first getting into value investing, you start thinking about cheapness and low PEs and you look at the most recent uh, list of stocks with low PEs. And one thing that I got in that trouble uh, in the habit of doing that was wrong is I would mm -hmm. find low PE companies. And then for some reason I would tell myself this PE is too Super low. Chat. Frank Tabor, he's sharing some of that. Um, some of that Kelly Partners money. <laughs> yeah, Frank. Frank can wait till after the story. Yeah, keep keep, keep going, okay, Jason. Yeah. We'll go, we'll get to Frank in a second. <laughs> Sorry, I'm, I mean I'm used to being interrupted by people you're talking to. That's just kind of a common thing that happens. But to be interrupted by someone <laughs> in a comment, okay. And, and, then in, uh, and then in, and then and then no no don't go, Jack don't call them dollars. Okay, you you and I are sitting in the Central Time Zone, United States, heart of the heartland of the country. <laughs> I see an A in front of that dollar, which I mean, oh, I, I didn't what see that's that. Even worse. Yeah. I, I didn't see that. Yeah. All right. Those aren't guy, dollars. Man. Those aren't dollars. So where, <laughs> where down, I was going. It's those down under dollars. <laughs> where I was going is um, uh, I would tell myself like, hey, this PE is too cheap. How can this company sell for a PE of four? I'm going to make money in this stock when the market starts valuing this at a comp as a company that just maybe they're not a huge grower but they make money and but i've come to the realization like no i don't control the market and if you're relying on an investment to go up not based on business results not based on like liquidation value and you you know like you're you have a margin of safety there but just purely on i think it's too cheap i think at some point the market will think it's worth more um that never worked out for me and I, I to me that's been a value trap because you're just focused on the pe you're not focused on your margin of safety and the the reason you would have success in the stock is reliant upon mr market and uh just purely and I, that's a big uh trap i got into when i was first getting into to value investing i wonder if it goes to that the catalyst point we we're talking about earlier where you have a stock let's say earnings are flat for 10 years and it's starting at a three PE or whatever. What is the catalyst? It's going to bring that multiple up. Um, people often want to see growth. So what, what is a flat stock going to be anyways um, from a multiple perspective? Um, but if there's nothing to get investors attention saying, Hey, this company's growing, the earnings are growing. It's harder to get, go from a three PE to a nine, 10, 11, 12 PE. Um, if assuming earnings are flat, yeah. just to keep this example. Um, going. So I, I wonder if it's just like a issue of catalyst from, from that perspective. Um, yeah, I would, I would um, tend to disagree with that. Actually. I, I don't think, mm -hmm. I don't think you really need a catalyst assuming that the earnings hang on. Like, I don't know the specifics of that particular investment, Jason, but I would guess the earnings just fell off a cliff and it was suddenly eight times earnings or something. And the mm -hmm. price hadn't moved. Party um, freaking city, Tom. That's yeah, what exactly. Called. So that's exactly what happened. Right? No, but, the, but no, time. no, that was a great learning experience because I bought the thing at 11 or $12 before, like, yeah, it had gone down from its more recent IPO uh, from like 18 or $20 to 11 or 12. And my thinking at the time as someone who was not very good at this, I was like, Oh, how can this company sell for like a five PE over time? That doesn't make sense. This thing's going to go up to a 10 because no, it's not a huge grower, but it makes money and I'm going to double my money. But then what happened is uh, the coronavirus happened and the stock price of Party City absolutely cratered. Uh, and the, the low, I think, was 48 cents. And then watching someone like Cliff Sosin buy it, not at 11 or $12 initially, but buy it at $5 and then buy it all the way down and all the way back up. Um, I think there's definitely, I agree with you, sometimes you don't need a catalyst and sometimes something is just so cheap. But for me, at a four or five PE party city, when it was like at eleven or twelve dollars, it was not cheap enough to to be thinking that way. When it got down to five, and then all the way down to forty eight cents, yeah, I think that's more so the range. So, uh, but that's how you can get in trouble with like the value trap terminology. It's like um, just because you think it's cheap, hey, guess what? Things can happen, and it can go way cheaper. Um, and may, and the other thing is like if it's not at that way cheaper point. Maybe it's the market does think some businesses just are worth PEs of four or fives because they think the moats are weak or they think it's risky. So, 
I think one common yeah. theme I've noticed in value traps is that a large percentage of the outstanding shares are owned by one group or one individual. That's something I've noticed. It does come up with things that might be potential value traps. Well, I, I agree with that because if, if you have management or a huge shareholder that owns, it doesn't matter what percentage, if they control the company somehow, whatever you think is about, I can go two ways. Number one, if you're buying it for assets, you may never be able to get their, your hands on those assets and the market realizes that because the management just won't uh, monetize them or, or increase the value. So you don't have that control. And even though you see the cash, you see the building, the headquarters that they paid off that's worth more than the market cap, it, it doesn't mean it's ever going to turn into anything if someone else controls it. The other problem with like a huge control position or someone controlling the company, and I really feel this now that I, I have a smaller amount of positions, is like you said earlier, Karan, management. Uh, humans do a lot of stupid things, and if they start doing stupid things, it can totally, it changes the thing that you invested in. Um, and that, that can, that can trap you because then it's a change thing that you bought into. There's another example that I had where, so I shared it with Jack, it's this Chinese railway that connects, uh, Guangzhou and Shenzhen. So it's called Guangshen railways and kind of the catalyst that was there with this railway was, uh, so all the stations that are there for the trains to stop, the land is owned by the railway itself. So if you just look at the value of the land, it's like almost three or five times higher. But the thing is, this catalyst will never be recognized because almost, I think, 40% of the shares outstanding are controlled by the government, essentially. So you see these sort of examples all the time in every market. I think it's it's not specific. You see it everywhere. So it's almost yeah. an issue of just not having a market, basically, because the shares just aren't out there or something like that. Also, they were listed on the New York Stock Exchange, but then they got delisted and then and that, they went that'll, in the, that'll sting. over the counter. That'll sting. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and I think you'll, you, I think you'll see these control situations where you'll just, you'll never realize the value of the assets, I think, um, in the small cap, the very small cap world. Um, and even though there's a ton of opportunity there, um, we're walking like a very thin line here. And there's a lot of ways to lose money or not make a lot of money as well. Tom, who was that person who flew out to Vegas and um, went and looked at the liquidation uh, value? <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. What was the story there? Yeah, uh, yeah so Andrew Brown's uh, also got a YouTube channel if, if no one's already... I don't know the story, but him. if someone's claiming yeah. to go to Las Vegas on a business trip to, to look up <laughs> asset values, there's other reasons you can go to Las Vegas. <laughs> Oh, give me a second, guys. Oh, that's no. turkey calling. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so Andrew, yeah, so Andrew is based in Ukraine at the moment. He's initially from Australia, but um, he was looking at uh, like a net-net situation. It was a very, very small company. I think the market cap was something like, oh, I don't want to get this wrong, but it was $10 million at most, I think, was the market cap. And... Um, Basically, there was, I think, about three or four times that just an inventory listed on the balance sheet. So it was a furniture wholesaler, and um, they were based in Vegas, and his plan was basically to fly from um, Ukraine to Vegas, uh, like basically pay a furniture valuer a, a few thousand dollars and um, try and figure out what the furniture is actually worth And um, before he sort of made that investment. That, that was his idea. And then he later found out that... Um, that inventory was actually spread through several warehouses kind of dotted around the world. I think most of it was in China from memory. So um, that that was that story. 20 <laughs> that, million worth of furniture is quite a, a lot of furniture. That's a lot of tables and chairs. <laughs> it's also weird that uh, we, we were talking about this a while back. Um, I think it was after a show one time. And it's just weird to be even publicly listed at $10 million valuation because it's not that mm. cheap to keep up with regulations and filings and like there's a there's a cost associated with that at that level um that's pretty significant uh so it's just interesting that 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 opportunity is even there um funny yeah. stuff yeah i mean no no institution's gonna buy a 10 million dollar rocket right. cap company right? yeah and it, um it's almost like it's like private equity level but it's publicly traded so it's very strange um frank uh let's get back to his super chat 
See, he wanted our thoughts on Ally, Ally Bank. He's really getting into financials, isn't he? Yeah, he, he, that, the Hingham experiment has brought him to different, a, a whole new road. Um, maybe it's tangentially related to the accounting practices of KPG that led him to banks. Maybe, maybe that's it. He just has that kind of uh, financial edge, if, if we'll give it that. Um, but let's let's check out Frank's tweet. I just I have it right here. I don't know about you guys, but I tend to stay away from financials because I'm like, I generally there are so many things I can't understand when it comes to, especially large ones. I think is the, I think the Hingham Institution um, one it probably makes more sense because it seems like it's more manageable to like really look at everything. It's a smaller, it's much bank. simpler. Yeah, it's not like these yeah. big conglomerates like a like a Chase. Like my goodness, like where do you even start uh, like <laughs> looking at Chase's balance sheet, for example? Um, anyways. Frank says, Ally is at 1.2 times book, buying back 11% of their shares, less than f- around a 50% efficiency ratio, 19% return on equity. First bank that has interested me since Hingham. Possible that return on equity can't be maintained as car prices are inflated currently, since they, they do a lot of auto lending, as, as far as I know. Some interesting mergers and acquisitions as well, one for the watch list. Um, I, as an ally customer myself, I have a number of bank accounts with them and I've never taken a loan with them though. And I believe their biggest uh, product, I, I'm not, don't quote me because I haven't done too much research at all into this, but I believe their biggest product is auto loans. So for cars, uh, they do do mortgages. So I'm not, I'm not sure how big that is on their balance sheet at this point. I think that that's a pretty recent product comparatively speaking. They also have Ally Invest, so they have like a brokerage arm, um, and then they have their their bread and butter savings accounts, and and uh, that's how I initially got introduced to them. They have a high yield savings account, currently paying a whopping 0.5 percent per year interest rate or something like that. It used to be like two percent, and I was like, wow, this is great compared to you know Chase and Bank of America paying 0.01 percent. Uh, this was like five years ago, and <laughs> now it's a uh, very different now. Uh, but if any of you guys ever looked at Ally or just how would you even go about looking at a bank if you have it all? No, it's, in, it's interesting doing some of the maths here. So what did what Frank say? It's like 1.2 times book, mm-hmm. 19% return on equity. So 0.19 times 1.2 gets me to about a 16% earnings yield. Um, so it seems kind of cheap on that basis. I don't know what sort of growth it's had over time, um, but I know I know Norbert Lou owns it. I'd be interested to see what Norbert Lou's cost basis is because I have a feeling he's made a lot of money on, on that stock, and it might have run up a fair bit here. I I just um, I, I'd wonder I'd want to see how their business is, business is uh, segmented because you're, you're really analyzing a few different businesses here. It's much more of a conglomerate than it sounds like. Hingham is Hingham is just more like we do almost one thing and that is we give real estate loans like very entrepreneurial style loans so you can kind of look at those from that lens with Ally they're doing a lot more broader scale stuff they have the investment arm they have auto loans they have mortgages they have just traditional sort of banking like there, there are multiple layers here to, to look into um, and I don't know if they're doing anything else behind the scenes with derivatives or whatever like a lot of banks do so who, who knows um but otherwise like they seem like a solid company just from a customer perspective and i've never had a problem with them they're easy to use so that's always a positive but uh yeah you know. yeah so i've i've just pulled up norbert Lou's cost basis on whale wisdom our, our namesake punch card punch card capital uh he he paid estimated price 16 dollars 90 a share and i think it's What's trading at now, like close 40 to 50. something? 46. Yeah. So it's Just run up a lot. Super chat. We got a super chat from Joe. PBI, profitable e com business, but they get no credit. What is PBI? Joe, isn't isn't ticker time oh. a show on Frank? Isn't that Frank's show? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Oh, well, let's have a quick look anyhow. It's uh, Pitney Bowes, the craftsman of commerce. That's yeah, all I know it. about them. <laughs> I get I get uh, I get packages from them for important real I estate. Have Joe's done any reviews or reactions to yeah. any production? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. I'm reviewing Pitney Bowes. Let's see here. Is this an American thing? Yeah. 
My understanding is they're like a, akin to like a FedEx, but I, I'm not too sure beyond that. Let's see. Technology company provides commerce solutions. I love, I love commerce solutions. Like it, that tells me absolutely nothing. <laughs> the company operates through global e-commerce, pre-sort services, and Centex solutions. So it's a conglomerate. The global e-commerce segment provides domestic parcel services. So this is what I'm familiar with. Cross-border solutions and digital delivery services. The pre-sort services segment offers mail sortation. Um, the Centex solutions provides physical and digital mailing. So yeah, it sounds kind of like a FedEx focusing on business mail it seems so like sounds fedex high, without the... sounds, sounds high margin probably actually this is this is ringing some bells now so i don't know if you guys have read the book goods are great by jim collins but this is actually mentioned as a case study company in in that book in the 60s they had uh like a monopoly on some sort of some sort of like postage meter machine, whatever that is. <laughs> yeah, I used one of those uh, at my old job. Actually, we have one in the office. It's a, it, it right. prints your it prints your postage right on there. Um, there it seems it seems like one of those monopoly type things. The U.S. Post Post Service it, it, in the U.S. at least it, there's a it's actually in the Constitution that says um, the U.S. has like the power. The government has is the only one that has the power to um, do regular mail. And you need to ask for a privilege from the government to actually deliver mail. Like it's constitutionally in there. Um, I never knew that until like I was an adult, um, even though it's, I always wondered like, you know, the post office does such a bad job. Why don't, why isn't, why isn't there just another one? Well, it's because you literally can't create a post office, um, <laughs> except you have carve outs for things like FedEx and UPS, Pitney Bowes and others. You, you guys have a plan on editing that thing or is the, that sort of locked and loaded for all of time? What? Well, oh, the, yeah. the it's been edited. It's been edited. Uh, how many amendments are there? What do you mean, Over? edited, Tom? <laughs> Tom. <laughs> when was it? When was that thing written? Seventeen seventy six. No, it wasn't. It was yeah, that, yeah, that'll work. I know, but that's that's a good year. <laughs> yeah, that'll work today. <laughs> it's hey, what, like uh, th there's been quite a few amendments since then. Okay, uh, okay. You, you know, like. Certain classes of people literally couldn't vote before. Now they can. So, like, we've made progress. Yeah, but we haven't had <laughs> amendments in, in a long, long time. And Tom, you know what's actually interesting is like, at this point in time, it almost seems it almost seems impossible that we would have an amendment because I think there's something like um, two thirds of state legislatures have to approve it or something like that. Three quarters. Um, three quarter. Oh, really? Seventy five percent. So you the, it, would, it would. You get the convention. <laughs> wow. It, it would have to be something. It's hard to think of anything that um, isn't already in place that three quarters would, would disagree on. Tom, you're turning yeah. into a macro investor. You're talking about intricate American political things. You're talking about inflation on your channel. I'm Focus sorry. I just, I, I, oh, wait, yeah, I, I, no, I it, just it came is two off thirds. And... Sorry. I, I, just to correct myself. It's two, on, thir Jack. two thirds of uh, all I, the states and two thirds of both the houses. So it's yeah. all the states too. That's what really gets you. It's not just the house and legislature, but anyways, yep. go on top. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. I, I just came off. I'm um, recording a podcast with some, with some guests all about inflation. So I must be macro minded right now. <laughs> yep. Yep. Dalio? Like... <laughs> hmm? No, it wasn't right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 Ray Dalio's got some good stuff. It, all this long-term debt cycle stuff. It's interesting, but I don't know how helpful it is. That's the problem. Let, let, me, let me focus, Tom, uh, back on the business. And uh, we have a please, question. Please and now if someone, as the king wait, of the wait, check. Wait. Yes. Hey, uh, Jason, real quick. Um, if you look at Penny Bowes, Look at that! Look at that gross, gross margins just for doing mail. No, that that is the, that is the number one thing that uh, stuck out to me at first. I was like, wow, they actually do have a nice margin. But then look what it did over time. That's, oh, it hit mm -hmm. back. What I want to show you. Thirty percent gross margin is not great for moving mail around. I mean, no, I yeah, like, I, I mean, like, I like one, but no. But know. you know what's interesting? Look, look at their revenue. You see, their revenue went from like two point three, two point six billion to over three billion. Mm -hmm. If you look at their operating income on that page we were just on, or down here, look at what their gross margin and their operating uh, margins have done over time. And then look at their operating income. Even though the um, the uh, mm. revenue went up, their operating income is going lower and lower. Which and that's the thing that struck me. And um, not to give a plug for whoever's ticker this is, uh, and feel free to give a plug. But that's one thing Joe. I like about tickers; they have a lot of stuff like this. 
Maybe they've diversified. <laughs> yeah, so maybe. they get no credit, but that's probably with good reason, you know. Okay, as the king of the chat here to here to in person to represent my people, I've come with a message oh. to the host of the show. Sometimes people like me and people like uh, we'll read their comment in a question. Steve, uh, we give great comments and great questions throughout the show early in the show, and by the mm -hmm. time we get the Q and A, uh, those questions are lost to the universe. So sometimes, sometimes. As I did tonight, I highly, strongly recommend, and it shouldn't be Jack, because you know what, Jack, you you take on enough on those shoulders hosting this show. You weren't there last week or two weeks ago. I was there. We needed you. So someone else. <laughs> wow. Thanks. <laughs> oh, Brad. Wow, just throwing the rest <laughs> of the team under the bus here. <laughs> He's right. So, He's Jack, right. You're, you're a great host. You're a great host. Thanks. I know what it takes to host a podcast. And uh, Jack's so good, he makes the rest of us look like that. Yeah, yeah, that's well, it. When that's he's it. gone, yeah. when he's gone, but yeah. when he's here, he uh, <laughs> he uh, he just tees it up for us. But um, someone, when you see a good question, you know, copy and paste it or something on a different browser window or tab, and get back to it. So, like I'm going to get back to Steve earlier in the show. He asked, "Is Baba a value trap?" And I want to ask Tom that. And why isn't it? Is it it's a not... great question? Like. <laughs> One thing I will say, uh, Jason, just real quick to yes. that, um, at least on StreamYard, I, if I click on a comment, it'll throw it under the screen, so I can't really copy paste it. So I try to scroll back when I can, but uh, and Jack, hard. like I said, you got enough on your shoulders. I'm not asking yeah, right. you to do it. I'm asking you one of these other freeloaders like... to pick up a little something here. You got a couple of ones, but down. you are why right. It is, it is difficult. Down. It is like, difficult. <laughs> why is the yeah. stock down? Yeah. Why yeah, is the stock down? Asking Tom that question. Well, Karan, it's um. I actually no. I'm I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm 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 asking I'm asking Tom, and I'm asking this to myself. Like, if someone said, "Hey, you know, why don't you think Alibaba is a value trap? Um, what what do you like about it that gives you confidence?" So you that, can't uh, explain that to someone who doesn't understand the business. If they don't understand it, it's like if a five year old comes to me and asks me the same question, I'm not going to break it down for him. You should be able to explain it. To I'm going to tell that five year old just listen? sit tight, like. <laughs> yeah, Karan, don't, don't, don't tell shut up. <laughs> um, well, my yeah, I mean, the short answer is I think they'll be earning a lot more money in ten years than they are today, and the valuation is reasonable. So, what else yeah. you want to know? Pretty much, I want to know why this thing's down fifty percent, and when it's coming people back. Are that's nervous. what I need to know. That's why. That's what of, my wife wants to know. There's a lot of nervous Nellies out there. Because Jason, because you keep questioning yourself. You need these. You need the these GameStop diamond hands or something. We should ask Haran <laughs> how we acquire those. Oh yeah. So I got another question I want to call back to. Um, I think to make this easy, Jack, you might be able to find it. It was the very top one um, mm -hmm. from Matt. Uh, is Arc ARC Document Solutions a value trap? And if I don't know if you can, but if you go to Open Insider and you look up ARC, uh, some a couple of the directors are buying the company and stuff, but oh my gosh, guys. Oh my gosh. The CEO of this company is buying massive amounts of the stock. And I see it. I look into it. I'm like, no, I don't really get it. I'm going to forget about thinking about it. Click click on that guy's name. So it'll go right to him. Uh, yeah, that one. Ooh, hello. And then scroll down. I mean, look... Uh, I mean, it's a serious amount of money for a small cap stock, um, and he's been what's, doing, what's been doing the, it recently. Uh, what's the market cap? Uh, I hope it's small. We'll see. I'm going to look it up. Arc stock. I think it's like 150, 142 40. million, and they've got, I think, like maybe 75 million in debt. So I think the enterprise value might be like 200 million. Okay. But but so what they do is they do like they do like corporate business like printing and visuals and stuff and um I think they're getting into a lot of other businesses. So when you look at it there's nothing that really stands out to me. Like I don't see any assets that are like worth way more than the debt. I don't think I see a lot of like growth with the revenues and stuff, but I think what they're doing and and this is an interesting kind of topic is like what do you guys think about these companies that are change, trying to change their businesses they're in or trying to expand into other business lines? And I 
think that's why they have confidence in this company so much because I think they're maybe seeing different business lines are going into and seeing growth there. Um, but it seems like that can be a catalyst sometimes. But we've also heard Buffett say when businesses try to turn around, usually the businesses win over the managers. Um, but yeah, so to answer Matt's question, that's what I'm seeing with that. I don't know if it's a value trap or not because uh, I don't really know what the what they see that's attractive about it. There's obviously something seems to be there, but I'm missing it. I don't know what it is. Pretty much always, yeah, a good, it's always a better sign when they're buying than selling, but uh, that doesn't, that's not always, that's a, for uh, sure. It's not a guarantee in any way, though. And, a, and another, uh, another similar one is if you look up Six Flags um, <laughs> on Open Insider, they, they are, they are buying massive dollar amounts of that company. And I mean massive, I mean millions of dollars uh, almost every week. I didn't even and realize I'm, it was publicly traded. <laughs> Six Flags. Yep. And, and apparently during the crisis with Corona, it went down to like a billion dollar market cap or something. Um, and I think at some point people were talking about the land they have um, as like the margin of safety. But speaking of management, I also read they put in some kind of one of those poison pill provisions during that time because they didn't want it to be taken over for the land. But um, massive amounts of uh, they're buying it. And I've got just this problem. Like I check Open Insider all the time. And so I see businesses that I don't really understand what's attractive about them or why, but it's hard for me to ignore when CEOs and directors are just buying tons and tons of uh, money into a company. See, Jason, Jason yeah. at that point, you had like two options. You could buy Dillard's following Ted, or you could have looked into Six Flags and look at the insiders buying in. What would you have picked? I mean... You so, Karan, are you, say, are you saying don't give as much credit to insiders, focus more on the, the super investors? Absolutely. At least that's what I think. I'm like, insiders... No, I need, it. Buy, I need to hear that. I need to always, hear that. Yeah, because, I mean, when you're looking at an investor buying it, there's only one reason they're buying into it. If management is buying into it, they might also have the aspect of signaling something. And they could it's be just possible. saluting themselves. They could think like, hey, we're going to do great things to this company. I believe it so much. Yeah. I'm going to buy more and more. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, and and insiders aren't turning over, you know, three stocks a week or something. Deep dives like Ted Wishler's probably doing. You know, they they run their own business and they obviously know that very well. But they're they're not yeah. they're not stacking that up against every other you know publicly traded. It's stock, a right? small universe of opportunities, and it's generally an opportunity of their own company, and that's it. They're not looking. At, yeah. They're not they're not comparing it to other things. Yeah. Jason, yeah. I I a quick question on similar topic here. So I know you focus a lot on. Uh, or at least you, I guess, sort of screen, maybe as we're describing it, like insiders buying a lot of stock. Do you have a do you have a way to do a similar sort of thing with companies that are buying back a lot of shares? Do you have any way to to pick that up? Because I mean, like a Berkshire Hathaway, for example, is just cannibalizing itself right now. Um, I and... don't at all. I don't. Well, I know. I'm sure there. I'm sure there's one out there. Um, I'm sure there is. Um, I don't pers I don't do that. Um, I use that kind of as a second filter. So once I'm interested in a company, to me, like, oh, it's a great sign if they're also buying back a lot. Or if we hear that, like, oh, Berkshire back bought back more stock, it can kind of be a catalyst in my own mind to go check it out. Um, but mm -hmm. I, I haven't ever uh, filtered for that. Um, okay. That be that be that that sounds like a good idea for sure. Yeah, it's it's tricky. I guess you you wouldn't want to pick up one of these companies that um just buys back stock regardless all the time you know regardless of valuation or whatever you well, want you yeah. want some way to pick up like the opportunistic buybacks right well what's weird is like when you hear about buffett talking about buybacks like uh in the 60s and 70s and 80s it sounded like it very was much like a capital allocation thing and kind of a more rare thing in recent years it became kind Super of chat. um a financial engineering thing to, and for some company or a lot of companies, you don't know if they're just doing it to keep the stock price high or pay their shareholders back. Not necessarily because they think the company's super cheap. Like general electric was doing a lot of buybacks way back when that was all wasted money. Pretty yeah. much. <laughs> yeah, it was. Yeah. yeah. I like this question from the boring investor about DCF. Although we have a super chart. From Joe again. All right, Joe. Joe cutting in line. <laughs> Thanks, Joe. Uh, 
Look at Domo Capital on Twitter. Domo Capital. What is that? That sounds like an investor, I think. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, The Stacey F question is quite interesting, though. It's a good question. No. I um any com before we do that any comments on Domo? Oh, that's funny. Domo mentioned uh, Pitney Bowes as well. So I wonder if Joe is a uh, avid follower, <laughs> or maybe Joe is the Domo investor. <laughs> Domo, Joe, Domo Capital. Joe has Joe has reviewed the Domo Domo Capital Twitter account. Yeah, I don't I I don't know. Um, we have, we have one Twitter. Uh, anyway, do, do you guys have a Twitter for this show? We don't actually. We have our individual Twitters. As the king of the chat, I need to bring a concern of my people to to the knights of the round table here, to the host the of their face. I don't um, know. If I guys... think there's a reason why we keep Jason in the chat most of these episodes. <laughs> no, sorry, Jason. Go ahead. Go ahead. Raise your concerns. I don't know if you guys read your YouTube comments, but you're getting a lot of requests for as much as I like looking at you guys. I listen to this when I'm on my tractor or whatever, and people want the podcast. So we don't have a Twitter. A uh, yes, it's a John Deere. They they have, um, and that's an American company, Tom, <laughs> from the heartland. I'm familiar. So, uh, Head headquartered up here, actually, up in Illinois. That's correct. Do you, do you guys have plans to put this out in audio podcast format? It'll probably take people away from YouTube, so it doesn't really yeah, make we, sense to uh, I, I think we, we. I don't want to do, do it. Like that's the, that's the problem. Um, someone would have to do it, and it's just like, you know, it's it's more work, and and like, what is the benefit? Eh, we're just kind of trying to weigh it that way. I think we probably should, but it's just kind of like we need. I don't to do you know. it. I think so. it's better to keep all the attention in one on one platform. And it's it's not really even just like the attention from audience. It's like the attention for us too. Like now we're managing multiple platforms, and again for like how much of a benefit, as much as it would be like helpful to have it on other platforms. I think at That's a certain a good, point it'll make good sense. Good thought. I hadn't thought about it from your perspective. I thought about yeah. it from the audience. By yeah, the way, you said my plate was you said my plate was full, right? <laughs> That's right. That's I'm, right. I'm, I'm, I'm I'm trying to I'm trying to host the the YouTube version. I can't do a podcast as well. However, Streamyard, the platform we use. Um, does allow you to go onto other platforms as well, like you know, Twitch and some others. I don't know if that's a that, it wouldn't really solve the podcast issue, but I wonder if you well, can do audio version. I would recommend to uh, people watching you on YouTube, um, YouTube Premium. Uh, it's not that much money, and you get rid of the ads, and you guys still make money. Don't worry, I saw Tom's face. Don't worry, you you still make money uh, from the views. Yeah, make them buy YouTube Premium because <laughs> what you can do is you can turn off your phone, and like you can turn it off and put it in your pocket, but it'll still play just like it's a podcast. So Jason, are you a, are you a Google shareholder by any chance? <laughs> yeah. Alphabet. No, I'm not. Seems like <laughs> no, I'm, I'm not. I, I bought, I bought it at 600 something dollars um, many, many years ago or not that many years ago. It shot up a lot and I made a very stupid decision uh, because I let news headlines and stuff kind of sway my thinking about the company, dumb macro news about the company instead of the company itself. And I sold it at like uh, eighteen hundred or something, and or, or fifteen hundred, and it's gone gone way up since then. So I learned a valuable uh, lesson um, in that early. Sale you made some money too. The, you know, you know who bought Google stock at I think about a hundred dollars a share and still owns it. Um, huh. is, she, is Shaquille O'Neal? <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. Are you mean? Is it Shaq or or Shaq's uh, financial advisor? I wonder. I, I I think it's I mean I think, I think it's, it's Shaq. Shaq. Like no. he has he has quite a few investments where he's like oh this is a pretty cool product. What, when like was it a hundred dollars? Around IPO maybe a little. I think this was there. prior to Android. So what? Uh, media <laughs> stock. I wonder like <laughs> what's he playing? Hey, IPO <laughs> around fifty. Yeah. So uh, yeah, two thousand. So yeah, it would have been around IPO probably unless he bought it. Um, yeah, it would have been IPO. Yeah, that, yeah, there's there's interviews with Shaq um, where he talks about it. Yeah, I think on CNBC. Um, I, I'm going to make a video soon about um, Forrest Gump investing in some fruit company. 
one of these days as well because i've done i've i actually sat down and read all the apple ipo filings and looked like through how many shares they issued and what dividends they've paid <laughs> since 1984 or something when they ipo'd and i i've done all the maths behind the scenes on what would have happened with a hypothetical hundred thousand dollar investment from one mr forrest gump and apple um <laughs> If my maths is right, I think he's been paid, would have been paid close to a billion dollars in dividends. Now. A billion. And <laughs> and he, he's probably about the 15th richest, richest person in the US, I think, if I've done the maths correctly. Um, the, crazy. That would be, that'd be a good little like <laughs> m- movie investors channel <laughs> where you just yeah. like do this stuff. That would be good TikTok content, actually, if you want to get into that, Tom. Like shorts of just like that. what would have what would movie characters have made had they actually done this? That would be kind of. It's fun. actually it's pretty funny in the in the movie, like you know how he gets the letter from like Lieutenant Dan's invested him in this um, <laughs> fruit company. You know, um, the date on the on the letter I think is 1975, and Apple wasn't incorporated until 1977. So he <laughs> got, he, he got <laughs> so in pre-founding got of Apple. <laughs> yeah, he got founder shares. <laughs> <laughs> Why don't we uh, why don't we wrap up to just because we said we were going to address it with the boring investors um, exciting uh, question a boring investor with exciting questions is the dollar ca- uh, or dollar discounted cash flow useless unless you have a deep understanding of a business and if you have a very deep understanding of a business and the business is trading cheap enough do you need the discounted cash flow to know it's a buy. Um, yeah, I, the first part you of the question is kind of easy. Fundamentally, I mean, what's that, Karan? You do need a DCF. I mean, fundamentally, that's kind of like the base of everything, or something like that. It's something about the earnings, at least um, earnings growth. Yeah. And, but you don't yeah, in an you, investment like Dillard's, right, where you're you're buying it thinking that okay, if if the business comes mm-hmm. back to something approaching normal and it cash flows, the stock price is going to zoom back up because it'll be valued as a business that makes cash flow again. And in the meantime, I'm buying it so cheap, more looking at the assets. I, I find myself so often uh, focused on like asset plays, at least lately uh, in a big way. So I know in asset plays where you're focused on the downside and margin of safety, um, I don't seem to be thinking about discount cash flow and future cash flows as much when I'm focused on the, va- the asset stuff. Um, I guess let me ask you a question. Um, Monish talks about this a lot, focus on the downside. The upside will take care of itself. If we think about discounted cash flow too much, is that focusing too much on the upside? No, I think it's, um, I think the core idea we're trying to get across here is you need to have some way of finding intrinsic value of a business. And sometimes that's asset focus. Sometimes it's discounted cash flow focus. Um, Uh, And focus on the downside in the DCF context is just buy it for a whole bunch less than the DCF raise the discount rate essentially or like we're bad case scenarios with their growth and stuff like that all of that yeah yeah put in conservative assumptions and buy it at a whole lot less than the number that's coming Uh, out of that adjusted for debts and everything even with the asset play where where you're focusing more on like liquidation value um well at some point if you're trying to hold it for a long period of time you are going to need some cash flow. So you're factoring in at some point, kind of like what you were saying, Jason, that like, uh, yeah, it might not be cash flowing now, but eventually it will. And if you're trying to own the business forever, you're going to need cash flows eventually. And maybe the cash flow is from selling assets and maybe that's not very sustainable, but like, you know, you're factoring in at some point. Um, it's just how you factor it in, how you discount it, like we're saying. I, yeah, I always I, have have cash, cash flow uh, top of mind, even with the... Uh, uh, more asset oriented plays in the short term. Do you guys do your formula thing when you look at stocks, the DCF formula? Mm-hmm. Yeah, just a simple analysis. Yeah. I actually use Tom's calculator. I edited it a tiny bit, but uh, um, yeah, just like a basic, very basic, not getting into super deep. Um, yeah, I, yeah, I, I do DCFs on businesses where it makes sense, like zero digit, it doesn't because you're focusing on liquidation value, but. For a lot of companies I do. And um, yeah, this is coming from someone who I think if I look at my YouTube analytics, I have about 50% of my subscribers have come from a DCF video, but I actually agree. I was one of them. Completely, <laughs> I, I agree almost completely with Tony G's comments here about 
um, should be obvious enough to be a simple math in your head. It should be hitting you over the head. And, um, you know, DCFs are, are nice to just double check. You're not doing anything too stupid. But you know, violating the commandments, like when we use Excel. So, yeah, that's <laughs> also another thing. It, it's when you it's when you try to make Excel dance that that you're uh, you're you're probably you're trying to create something out of nothing and you got to be very careful. Yeah, that, to do that's that. my, my problem with the DCF thing is it, it, um, it takes assumptions about the future. So that's one way to put all your biases in there. And then, well, you're doing that in any formula. case, you're doing that in any case though, whether yeah, but I, I like, or not. Yeah. Yeah. I just, I, my new, my thing in recent months has just been the, the no brainer thing that just the gut feel thing. Like if it's not hitting me over the head, and it just doesn't feel like an absolute no-brainer after doing a checklist and all that. I kind of, I'm just trying to say pass more. Yeah. Agreed. I mean, uh, investing is almost entirely, has not has a lot of elements of predicting the future. And DCF Fortune is telling. Just, yeah, it's <laughs> just one way of yeah. trying to put that into the prob- it. Playing the probabilities. Me. That's right. Having a, a a bear case, a middle case, and an a optimistic case are it's probably a decent way to go about it. That's where a DCF could be helpful. You can be like, okay, let's say it's not as obvious as I think it is. And what's my downside? And that's where you can kind but, of- But you know what's interesting about yeah. investing is someone can hear you say that like uh, bear case, middle case, and then bull case. But it's like, it always comes back to the individual's ability to judge yeah. the ac- their own yeah. accuracy. And that's yep. how so many people can get so self-deluded, including myself, about all these different stock ideas. That's what makes yeah. it tough. You have to have some yeah, business I, knowledge, whether that be just studying other businesses, studying running, being a business owner yourself. Um, I think that goes a long way. And specific industry knowledge can help too. Like you don't have yeah. to play the whole stock market. It can just be certain things. Right. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I think, um, yeah, doing like a base case, bull case, bear case, all that, um, makes sense but i think if you're about to invest in a company often you've got a more optimistic view than the average person on that <laughs> yeah it's true, true. Um, and yeah. i think i think you need to be very pessimistic like um jason i think you just did a podcast episode going through i want to say it was padevco right and you were like um yep. you know what happens if oil is 40 dollars or 60 dollars or 90 dollars? yeah I that's, the I mean, numbers you're using but that's a nice yeah. way to do it i think and and when like, i was re- Planning that episode, I, I even got down on the stock idea myself. I was like, wait a second, is this thing even that attractive? That's how much I had beat it up in my own head. But yeah, yeah. when I think about it, it's like I'm that's because I'm trying to plan for a scenario where oil doesn't go much higher than like 50 or 55. And it still maybe to mm-hmm. me would be worth something. But then I could be wrong about oil. So, you know, we'll see. Yeah, I think, um, I think Matt. Matt's point here about Buffett doesn't do DCF. I think you're probably right. Like Buffett's not firing up Excel, <laughs> but that, but that's the, that's the thought process he goes through though as a DCF. Like he's said very clearly before that the value of any business is you know. Present well, you know, in future cash Matt, Matt had an interesting part of his comment there where he said pricing is all about the free cash flow yield, and um, there's this talk, there's this book called Snowball, the the Warren Buffett. Uh, uh, biography and I forget her name's Esca- Alice Schroeder maybe I think but um, I think that's her name um, she gave a talk if you look it up on YouTube like look up her name Warren Buffett technology company story or something she talks about a private investment that Buffett made in like this uh, this card tabulating machine or paper company in the 60s or something because he knew people who were running it or something and she in that talk talked about like his filter being, am I going to get 15% cash on my investment in year one? Um, and then you got to think about like, well, will that continue? Does the business have a moat and stuff? But I do, to, to back up Matt's comment here, I do remember here talking, her talking about her interpretation of Buffett. And he was focused on um, the cash flow, free cash flow yield in that first year he buys it. That's another difference with Buffett versus like every single other investor, including myself. I think everyone and then including myself is too future focused on like, well, the earnings next year are going to be this, or the earnings in three to five years are going to be that. And when you hear Buffett talk and write about investments, he, he looks back at like the last, the, the years leading up to this, and he's not being too optimistic about the future. So very that, that's how I, way of looking that, at it. That's how I approach real estate deals. I 
barely do any projections and it'll be more of a feel like, okay, how reasonable is it that rents will stay where they are or, or is this too optimistic for year one? And then from there, because of, you know, principal pay down accelerating through the, through the life of it, I know it'll only get better as long as things can be stable. So Jack, are you, a, are you focused on, are you focused on monthly cash flow when you make a real estate mm-hmm. investment? Wow. Yep. Okay. Yeah. I'm reading a book about that right now. And the way this guy talks about that, it sounds like it could be any business, including any stock we could invest. No. In. Yeah. Yeah. And that, that's why this, this value investing like camp really spoke to me. Cause it's like, I was already kind of doing it with real estate. It, it makes a lot of sense. You're trying to get something at a discount and you're trying to get it at a decent yield or whatever it is free focusing on cash flow in particular. Um, Granted, it's a lot harder to come by right now in both real estate and stocks, um, having something with a fat yield. Uh, but yeah, it, it's it's the same. A lot of the same principles apply, just kind of different mechanics. You have loan products and all this stuff that you can take advantage of and whatever. The different asset classes have their differences, but at, at their core, they're very similar when it comes to uh, a- approaching, investing in them, valuing them. At least that's how I see it. Yeah, I just one final comment on this whole um, Buffett valuation thing. Um, I heard on the, I'm not sure if you guys listened to a podcast called Focus Compounding. Um, they're, well, as the name suggests, like kind of concentrated value investors and it's, it's, a, it's a really good show. Um, and they brought up the point that Buffett often invests in companies where there's been quite a, quite a clear change in capital allocation strategy. And that's something that DCF doesn't capture, like, He's talked a little bit about when he made the Apple investment that Apple had made it very clear that they're about to pay out this big pile of cash and increased dividends and a whole bunch of buybacks when the stock's trading at 10 times earnings. So that's something a DCF won't won't really capture very easily. And um, I think Buffett, that's something that flows through Buffett's head for sure. That was because of Carl Icahn, right? He got about that change with Apple. He was working. Or, or, he was one of many screaming at Apple. I, it wasn't, I think... <laughs> yeah. I think David Einhorn might have been involved. I think he might have been involved. I'm not sure. Yeah, I mean it's a massive comp- company. There are plenty of people saying they should they should start paying out some of this money. Oh, okay. Uh, let's wrap up with Manu's comments because I like them a lot. Um, it's right over an hour and a half now. Math slash probability is still included in the feel if you're experienced enough. I, I would definitely concur with that. I think that's probably where Buffett's kind of coming from, um, where he's not doing the hard math, but he kind of has an idea like. He this doesn't have to because he knows like. he knows the numbers so well. Yeah. Right, right. That and uh, also because it's a baseball analogy, you got to stick with it, and not cricket, Tom. Um, it's also You've been like the ashes too. <laughs> yeah, right. It's also like a baseball pitcher doesn't calculate Newtonian trajectory of the ball, but has pitched enough to have a feel for it. And I, like you've done the repetitions, you've looked at a bunch of businesses, maybe you've done the math on them in hindsight, and now when a new opportunity comes up, you don't really even have to do. You don't have to think about the mechanics. You don't have to think about the analysis because it's just kind of natural. Um, repetitions, I suppose, is the the thesis there, and I I, I I like that. It hits you over the head. Yeah, or hits you in the head like a baseball being thrown at you, <laughs> something like that. <laughs> Hopefully, not too hard. Um, yes. Anyways, uh, well, this was great. Thanks for stopping by again, Jason. Always always a pleasure having you. Yeah, it's a um, pleasure to be here. And if you guys want to see more content. Uh, more value investing stuff. Be sure to subscribe. We'll put out a new episode every single week around this time. And uh, we'll occasionally have guests like Jason on when when we need to fill a spot because uh, uh, we have lots of time zones to coordinate. So it can be kind of tough. <laughs> so uh, um, also check out the Discord if you want to uh, go talk with people over there about value investing. We're in, we're in there a good amount of the time as well. And uh, yeah, otherwise, until next time, everyone. <laughs>